presentation. Welcome back to another Untitled TIFF review. I am one of your hosts, Matt Rohrbeck, alongside he's allergic to tomatoes, but he is tomato meter approved, Eric Marchin. Matt, we're in the middle of TIFF. We are. How you feeling? Okay, uh, I got some rest uh, the other day, and uh, I, I think I really did need it, um, especially because you think, like, oh, you know, when the start of the festival happens, you know, we've been watching a lot of stuff in terms of, you know, digital screeners, but also attending in person where we can. Um, yeah. And then, you know, on the Rogers side of thing, like, I was trying to get as much done as possible for the next two weeks mm -hmm. that, you know, I was almost, like, burning the candle at both ends, like, recording oh, totally. yeah, voiceover same. reviews yeah. at, like, five in the morning <laughs> yeah. before, like, getting up to I, go to a screening i underestimated how much you know uh you know we've done this festival for over a, a decade plus now i covered it for the last little while but like i underestimated because we both don't live downtown anymore um that taking the train in every day and having screening spread out and um and then also recording video versions of the reviews because if we were just doing audio that simplifies it a little bit more but how much more time and, and work that adds that it added for a very exhausting like even more so like i know it's part of the fun is to be exhausted during tiff because you're seeing stuff all day but we're probably also getting older <laughs> and like true but also you have to either, think but... about the pandemic as well because yeah. last year we were you know completely and utterly quarantined and at, at our home, home. Yeah. uh yeah. you know watch I, I was you were kind enough to invite me over to your place to watch a lot of stuff um and so you know we haven't been as active in terms of commuting in, in general yeah. so that is also a, a shock to the you. system yeah. right um but I am excited to talk to you because today we are reviewing Pablo Lorraine's Spencer uh starring uh Kristen Stewart uh Timothy Spall Sean Harris Sally Hawkins uh, Jack Farthing, um, and more. Uh, Matt, why are you laughing? I just, when that credit came on, I'm so, such an immature kid. Like, cause you know, this is a very elegant, uh, but still dark, uh, kind of movie. Um, but when Jack Farthing came on, I just kept thinking of Jack Farthing and, and laughed anyways. Great way to start. <laughs> and I'm wearing a byway shirt, which is the, uh, the, uh, keep elegant, it classy, Matt. Um, yeah. Keep yeah, it yeah. classy. So, which is what this movie does. Eric, let's get into it. What is Spencer? Yeah. So, um, if you saw Pablo Lorenz, uh, Jackie, uh, which depicted, uh, Jackie Kennedy Onassis in sort of a historical fiction context and surrounding, uh, the assassination of JFK, but from her perspective and sort of, uh, the fallout, uh, afterwards and seeing how a public figure presents themselves um, both, you know, to the world, but also personally. And so Loren, um, you know, collaborating with writer Stephen Knight, um, who's done some really good stuff with Dirty Pretty Things and Eastern Promises and Locke, but also has the notor <laughs> notorious film Serenity on his uh, uh, credits as well, writes uh, an internalized gothic period piece that's also basically set in a single location at the Sandringham um, uh, castle or house and it's basically from the point of view of uh, the late uh, princess die over the course of three days and those three days being Christmas Eve into Boxing Day and mm -hmm. within the context of this vacation this family vacation with the royal family we see Princess Di, the Princess of Wales, um, contemplating whether or not to leave the family and get a divorce, um, and also thinking about sort of her role um, in both a historical context, but also a personal one and trying to find herself again um, and, you know, find the person that she was before she, you know, was assimilated into this family. And what a lot of people were excited about is that, you know, you have Pablo Loren who made this really spectacular biopic that obviously took, you know, artistic liberty with um, the historical aspects of uh, Jackie Kennedy Onassis, but did something really unique within the context of a biopic and not telling a cradle to the grave story. He does this here in a very similar fashion where, you know, his influences in telling this sort of key moment that again his historical fiction 
but kind of getting a sense of the emotion uh, impressionistic wise and how things are going. But you see influences from uh, Stanley Kubrick, Nicholas Rogue, uh, Terrence Malick with the cinematography, uh, Claire Mathon, who we just talked about uh, as the cinematographer for Celine Sciamma's Petite Mama, uh, does some really interesting work, especially with the floating camera stuff. Uh, you have Johnny Greenwood uh, composing the score, which is this really, really fascinating. Also has two films at the festival. Too. Yeah, with The Power yeah. of the Dog. In, in this case with Spencer, it's a combination of lush orchestral with experimental jazz. Jazz, yeah. And, and again, the same thing with like what Mika, Mika Levy did with um, Jackie. It, with it, that it, horror score. Yeah, <laughs> it's so yeah. unsettling. Yeah. Um, and visually speaking, the film, again, you, you know, there are moments where the character is reading a book about Anne Boleyn and, and her relationship with Henry VIII. And there are moments that feel, you know, straight out of Portrait of a Lady on Fire, which, again, same cinematographer, <laughs> yeah. but same style. Um, I think Stuart is good in scenes, but I don't know if she's as great as everybody's saying. That's not, I'm not saying that Stuart is not good. I think she is very solid in the film mm. and she has more than proven herself uh working with the likes of uh, olivier assayas in both personal shopper and clouds of sills marie so if you need any proof that she is you know a, a really solid actor and not just a, you know a teen idol trying to position herself as you know a, a movie star slash actor you just go and watch those movies and oh no and i think yeah. this furthers that like i, I mean i'll i I'll push back a little bit, and I sure. do think that she's she's great. And um, I mean, I, I I see where you're say what you're saying, and I I think that there are times where you see Kristen Stewart. Um, there, no, there's of, never a time, in my personal opinion, where that you get she lost disappears in, it. in yeah. the role of Princess Di. Stewart has these mannerisms and bag of tricks, especially the way like she that. holds her like, shoulders. Yeah, like that. that is there, is present, yeah. but it's. It's a performance that is and very And when she yells, I can really hear her and the accent kind of comes yes, away. And yeah. when she like kind of screams or or gets loud, like I kind of see it. But I do think that she, you know, she does a pretty good Princess Die. Like I it is coming from the Kira Knightley kind of school of acting. And I think Kira Knightley sounds more like Princess Diana than maybe Kristen Stewart does. But well, Kira Knightley's um, also British. <laughs> I know. That helps. <laughs> that definitely helps. But right. like I went back and like watched some Princess Die interviews and stuff like that. I'm like, oh yeah, yeah. She really sounds and like just the way her mouth moves and how she uh, uh uh, speaks i think um you can kind of tell that that's what kristen stewart's going for here i think she does a pretty good job um i i i'm with you where i don't think i like this maybe as much as uh jackie um but i was kind of i think it is very much a spiritual sequel to that movie. a companion piece a companion piece a perfect double feature where um maybe he'll complete you know a thematic trilogy with another uh prominent woman um but i i really kind of liked the the isolation in this movie and the cinematography which you're talking about this single location even though it is a gigantic location and just kind of the personal in inter inner struggle that kind of dies going through in this like uh, uh you know uh, historical fiction and i like that it starts a fable based on tragic events and things like that and of a tragic um, true story a tragic true story yeah and i just kind of um I, I like those kind of horror and unsettling elements that we got in Jackie. I think it's um, you compared this to the shining a little bit. And I think other people um, are doing that as well um, of just kind of going mad in this, in this location. Well, um, even the way that the, 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 the halls and, are filmed yeah. and, and, and you mentioned the camera moves, but like even when there's a scene where, so Timothy Spall plays uh, a former it's major watching. <laughs> yeah. And there's a scene where, you know, he has a, a confrontation with her in the, the fridge the kitchen yeah. fridge in the basement and it almost feels like you're looking at a character who walked out of the shining like a ghost you yes know? and i think that's what's it's kind of cool where it portrays the the um the uh matriarchy and the monarchy um as these you know this controlling kind of presence that's Suffocating. always there yeah and i think that's really well portrayed in the movie and, and really timothy spall is that ghost following around this house or saying like i always have my eye on you and always telling her um what she can and cannot do and i think that is really really 
really good. And and you mentioned the food too of Sean Harris plays a, a chef and I and think And a very like, uh likable role too. Like yeah. he's not like usually like Sean Harris is a, a really wonderful character actor, but he always plays either despicable characters or people that yeah. are on the verge of having sort of like a a, a breakout of some kind. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and he just plays a really wonderful chef in this and I like the use of food which you're talking about that sequence in the refrigerator and it's kind of like the through line of the excess of this all and like um and I just kind of like how you portray the monarchy and use food as that one thing that shows and even the way the movie ends with some KFC that like food plays a huge part in this and I think the juxtaposition there between that KFC and 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 you know the excess well of the food ruling class this, like, versus you yeah. know the citizens right yeah and I just that through line of, of food being like how fucked up and and you know just awful that sometimes in the excess of it all and the and the controlling nature of it all through food i thought was really interesting um but yeah man i i really dug the movie like i I liked when it got weird in moments um you know there's a sequence eating some uh pearl soup i like the ghost of anne boleyn kind of following around and even though it's maybe a little on the nose but well so um, is so is the necklace so uh the pearl necklace which again there's this obvious representation of it being a leash that the royal family have uh diana yeah. on but then there's also the context of well um you know you watch interviews with with princess diane she talks about you know when she left charles the reason why she left she felt she said you know three's a crowd because charles relationship with camilla he was having an affair with her and and I don't want to I don't want to sympathize with Charles, but I think Charles himself was put upon by the queen and sort of, you know, having to marry die where the love of his life was Camilla, even though I'm not I, I'm not siding with him because I do think Princess Di is a very sympathetic person and probably the only person within the royal family uh, that I've ever felt any, you know, sympathy, towards. sympathy or humanity <laughs> for because yeah. I've never gotten um the fascination with the royal family and this is coming from somebody that has a huge british background my grandparents are both british my grandmother is a huge fan of the queen which i think that this movie is very damning she's like the the villain (laughs) she's like just the looks it's just like it's great it's a very yeah gives great scowls but so does the queen (laughs) <laughs> no, she is like they portray her in such a fun way of like that she is just it's almost this presence, right? That's just there and the looks that she gives. It's a mostly silent performance for the most part, right? Yeah. And I even like you know how it's portrayed that, you know, she's all the queen is always supposed to be the last one to arrive to something, and how Diana's constantly just kind of upstaging her by showing up maybe just after the queen gets there. And just the queen's presence throughout the movie and um um, Stella Gonet is, I think, the actress. Yeah. Um, uh, sh- just her facial expressions throughout the movie are just fucking fantastic. <laughs> like it's just like it is, and the Yorkies too. And like like oh, anytime God. the Yorkies yeah. follow behind her, like again, it is very uh, critical and 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 damning of her. And but at the same time, I think it also lets Charles off the hook a little too yeah. much in in sort of a key scene later on in the film. Um, but not to say that he didn't have his own problems, but I just feel like, you know, he still was responsible for, you know, treating Diana so horribly. Um, and you you watch the film and it also is looking at, you know, it's it's a very elliptical movie, like narratively speaking, where it's not linear in its storytelling going from, you know, day one to day two, day three in yeah. a kind of traditional manner. Um, but it also does depict mental illness and anorexia and yeah. binge eating in a, an interesting way because it's showing you that, you know, this highly publicized and profiled, you know, uh, woman who you know did a lot of amazing charity work and you know deserved better than what she got um was still a human being as well and she still struggled through all of you know the things that anybody could that is dealing with not only being under the thumb of the monarchy but also just trying to you know escape a bad relationship and making it all the worse is that you know she has two children that she loves dearly and she's trying to do the best for them in the situation right uh, you know and how that plays out i think is also very um interesting but yeah i found myself more fascinated by the aesthetic 
and it does um, have this kind of foggy kind of it's a gauzy, gauzy almost like cur- yeah. perfume ad kind of look to it and again like it's it looks like you put a filter over the whole thing and yeah i agree that it's pro- you know i think because of the royal family and and it has that aesthetic that almost does look like it's even more of a period piece than and the in costumes the 90s play and a like, huge oh, the costumes role are in this. gorgeous obviously um i like, i really loved even though sally hawkins is in, in it much but um she's great her tailor her personal tailor diane's tailor and confidant and um i really like that she could be completely candid and open uh with hawkins and and again like you said like i think spall is great in the movie i think harris is awesome in it um i i like the idea of it being a single location almost a ghost story in a way it's very haunting um johnny greenwood score i I, you can't say enough good things about that guy like i love that like you know we we were talking about it you know with trent reznor um you know and atticus ross Ross with uh, nine inch nails and then you know johnny greenwood with radiohead and and you know people like paul thomas anderson and now pablo loren and um just champion yeah yeah, it's just it's just really weird to see these guys who are like anti-establishment sort of like experimental rock stars musicians now almost becoming like these you know prestigious high high class yeah prestigious (laughs) composers and making these really still you know um experimental and out there scores but still working within the context or frame of you know movie making it's it's just so bizarre and there's some of the best there's some of the best composers working right now like i don't think that there are many people um out there that you can say you know mika levy obviously is is amazing and um you know well there are some composers where you know there's not many where you see them attached to a movie and you're excited because of the composer and i don't mean that as a slight or like a like oh the music doesn't matter because i i again i i think it's a huge part of what elevates a, a, a film uh, and i think greenwood and those guys in atticus ross and, and trent reznor are yeah it's so fascinating to me that like yeah them being attached to a movie i'm like fuck yes i can't wait to hear what they bring to this movie and it, it and yeah the score in this going from that you know what you would as- uh, kind of expect a you know a classical prestigious score to be and then it has this unsettling jazzy kind of music in certain sequences as you're going through diana's kind of psyche and and her kind of slowly um kind of uh pushing back against the monarchy throughout the movie and and continuously kind of just going what the fuck is this why am i still here kind of thing and um and i just kind of like that personal struggle and how it's portrayed in this and again following up jackie it's just unexpected and i think like this is exactly kind of what i'm looking for from a biopic right and yeah i know yeah and 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 i think like that traditional you know wikipedia style biopic is just kind of I'll take a even something that doesn't completely always work with this or something like a casting like Kristen Stewart that like I think she's really, really, really good. But um, maybe I but then I'm contradicting myself because I I also think that maybe she's miscast a little bit. And I always like when you cast an American uh, doing an accent, like it can always kind of be distracting. And And I I always wonder what the British cast is thinking. Like there are scenes with her and, and Sean Harris and I'm thinking like, what is this like? British actor, this character actor, this veteran thinking when he's acting opposite an American. I mean, obviously he's probably very professional and, and she's been- great. And I like what she's done with uh, same with, um, uh, Robert Pattinson after the twilight franchise, like both of them have just made phenomenal choices. And I think both are great actors and I think she is very good in this, but I can't help, but then go, maybe there could have been a better choice right but, but at the same time you have to think like could have that it could spencer have been made without her yeah because that's, that's the fair. other thing with robert pattinson where sure he's, the name alone helps. you know like as much as like claire denis or the safty brothers like for pattinson or olivia sayas you know they're they're great filmmakers but sometimes they struggle as well to get funding and and things like so that to put and, a name like that after yeah, yeah I, I totally agree with that and um don't get me wrong i i actually do think that she's quite good but there are a couple times where you go oh it's Kristen Stewart or there are a but lot can, of times where you, go, you can kind of forgive that a little bit because it is a, a very surrealist take on it yeah and, and, I agree and, with and that another movie well. uh, you know we talked about both Jackie and um you know this I, I didn't like uh Spencer as much as Jackie I think Jackie is one of those movies where it's like if, if Jackie didn't exist and I saw Spencer I think I would be a little bit more impressed by it but But you already saw kind of the better version of this movie. yeah it's the same thing with like i I was talking to you about like first reformed where like if first reformed hadn't been released and card counter you know was paul schrader's 
would have been Paul Schrader's best movie in decades if First Reformed wasn't released. And it kind of has that same kind of feel where it's like there are certain expectations going into it now. Um, But in terms of the biopic as well, like I completely agree with you. And and I think another one that a lot of people have forgotten about a little bit, um, but is also actually really solid and sort of doing something at least kind of different and almost like a stage play is the Steve Jobs biopic mm-hmm. with Michael Fassbender. Yeah. Not to be confused with the Ashton Kutcher uh, Steve Jobs biopic. Which is the more traditional kind of... And just a terrible yeah, movie in general. But you look bad, at the yeah. way that the, that movie is told, you know, at three, you know, launching press conferences for, you know, new tech, and it's done like a behind the scenes kind of play. Oh, I think and, Jobs is great, yeah. Yeah, Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs, sorry, <laughs> yes. That, that's I hate that. Yeah, the yeah. other ones is Jobs, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Steve Jobs is great and is exactly what we're talking about. Like, take, you know, I, I'm cool taking artistic liberties. Like, I don't need you to just exactly tell me how their life is. Like, I'd rather you put some style and make it weird, but then still give me what this person was, but in this condensed kind of, you know, whether it's one moment in their lives or, or some seminal moments in their lives. And then whether you use genre elements like in both Jackie and here or, or with the score or just like, and again, yeah, you make a great point about Kristen Stewart because it is this fable based on uh, a, a tragic true story. You can kind of go, okay, like I get that these are people you know playing characters and that you can kind of uh, forgive that. And, um, and I think that just totally works for both Jackie and this movie. And um and I do hope that he does uh, another one in this vein. Like, I don't want him to get stuck in a box and only do movies like this. But he is um, doing other stuff as well. Like, even yeah. though we didn't like um, Emma, you know, he's still kind of going back and forth. And he's one of those guys that's hit or miss for me. But when he hits, he's usually great. And you mentioned something that, uh, as well that I want to go back to is that he's great with single locations. Um, yeah. He made a movie called The Club um, a, a little while ago. And that's a movie about disgrace. Well, you, this is much bigger than many single locations. <laughs> right, right, right. Yes, yes, yes. But it does still feel you do still feel that claustrophobia from oh, totally. Diane's point of view and that the yeah. world is this world is closing in on her to the point where she can't breathe anymore and the only way to escape is that she has to just completely and utterly cut herself off from that family um literally but but yeah the club which is about a, b- a bunch of disgraced priests sharing this sort of um home together is very hard to watch at times because of what these priests have been accused of and sort of like what the catholic church is doing but the way that he handles that he he's so good at kind of building up tension and and it it is also fascinating to think like people are really having great reactions to this and like oh we haven't seen you know anything from him for a while but i already mentioned emma which also got its theatrical release this year because it was delayed because of the pandemic and it played tiff a couple years ago but then the thing that i haven't watched and i know maybe you watched one or two stories yeah yeah. the stephen king adaptation so you know he's been he's been doing stuff since jackie you know and, and working with darren aronofsky and producing and and things like that and directing and and so, oh, and another thing I think that's also worth noting about this, uh, one of the producers on this is is uh, Marin uh, Adi, uh, who is the director of uh, oh, what's I'm uh, the the movie that you didn't Tony like. Erdman. Tony Erdman, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's interesting. I didn't know that, but yeah. yeah. Um, but no, man, I, I I actually quite enjoyed this. Like, um, I will always get behind a weird biopic that kind of. Um, takes it and twists it and uses, you know, strange kind of genre elements to kind of um, portray real life kind of um, things people are feeling or what they're going through. And like, I'll always take those over the classic kind of paint by numbers biopics. So even though it doesn't always work, yeah, I love the cinematography. Johnny Greenwood's score is just, he's on another level. It seems like, like with this and power of the dog, like, um, this year um and i just i hope he keeps doing more and more because even like trent reznor and atticus ross they seem like they're kind of getting more and more work and and greenwood i know was attached to pta for the longest time and that's really the only person he was kind of working with right yeah and Um, and he's which is also interesting because he's not working with uh paul thomas anderson this year but they have been talking about working on other projects (laughs) together yeah, I mean, he did do uh, "You Were Never Really Here" as well, which is amazing. Right? Um, which Ramsey's is another film. great score. So um, he's just on another level. I like the look of the movie and the flowing cinematography, and like 
Um, you said at times it can, I think you mentioned it during the review, look like a perfume ad and stuff like that. But I think that's obviously it is intention. intentional. And especially yeah. with that gauzy cinematography where mm-hmm. it almost looks like the filter is meant to be like a L'Oreal ad or something like that. Mm-hmm. And, um, and the costumes are, are fantastic as well. And, um, yeah, I, I really liked it. I'm going to give it a four out of five. I'm going to give it a three and a half out of five. And I also will say in terms of like the weirdness, I, it has a music cue that I was not expecting. <laughs> <laughs> oh the, with mike and the mechanics yeah yeah okay yes which weirdly does feel because it's the only like licensed song when you have mostly an unsettling kind of score throughout so when then that score finally happens when she feels kind of free um i think that it, it's a really kind of um interesting choice that yeah i was not expecting either but i think it it, it works and kfc man it made me want some fried chicken so. <laughs> and it is an interesting that's it, it is a weird place to end the movie too which i just like again sure. like it's 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 a great moment of sort of catharsis and release but it's just interesting thinking like you know more movies should end with get people getting kfc no <laughs> or going through agree. a drive through or something yeah, i don't know absolutely uh thank you all for listening you can get all of our tiff reviews uh right here on the untitled uh youtube channel so hit subscribe hit that notification bell click a thumbs up um all that stuff or if you like an audio version you can head over to any podcast service and just search for untitled movie reviews and you can get all the audio versions for all of our tiff coverage and all of the movies we've covered before that there's 270 plus reviews that you guys can go back and listen to if you want um we really do appreciate it head over to our letterbox at untitled underscore movies our hq over there it's where we post all of our ratings all of our social links are over there our personal accounts uh, YouTube videos, schedules, all that kind of stuff. So head over there. And as always, my name is Matt Rohrbeck. You can find more of my work around the internet, but mostly at UntitledMoviePodcast.com. And you can follow me on all those social medias at Matt Rohrbeck. And I'm Eric Martian. You can find more of my video re- reviews at RogersTV.com slash CinemaScene. Uh, there is a new episode that is currently broadcasting, uh, which has Matt on the episode. And we talk about uh, TIFF titles that we're looking forward to seeing. So it's a little bit dated now, but it'll be interesting in retrospect to see what we uh, liked in comparison to what we were anticipating um it'll be available to stream shortly so uh you know keep your eyes and ears open on my social medias at em6211 where i will uh post that until next time all i need is a miracle all i need is you